Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Journey Museum and Learning Center's latest journey discussion. I'm Troy Kilpatrick, the Executive Director here at the Journey Museum and Learning Center. And thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a new time and a, and a different day from our other journey discussions. Uh, but my guest today, Mr. Paul Priest and I thought it was very significant to do this on Sunday afternoon, March 7th. So we're being joined today by a man who's living history, Mr. Paul Priest. Um, and the great part about this program is that, um, you know, we started talking about this several months ago, but we're getting this recorded. And so it'll always be available at journeymuseum.org as a journey discussion, it'll be available. Um, and Paul has so much to say and so many good memories uh, to share with us to the significance of uh, all of this that has happened. I think it's important that we have this history and that we celebrate it. And I, I know Paul will join me. We wanna make sure that we're saying thank you all the time to all the men and women who served in our military branches here in the United States, such a big deal for all of us. So Paul, uh, thank you for your service. And we thank, you know, Rapid City is a military town the way I see it, Ellsworth Air Force Base and the high level of service it goes on through our state. So if, if a journey discussion is new for you today because it's a Sunday afternoon and you're drawn to hear this conversation with Paul uh, today, upcoming our next journey discussion will be Thursday, March 18th, the day after St. Patrick's Day. We're going to have Mr. Randy Christensen uh, join us and he reenacts Colorado Charlie Utter. And so he's going to kind of bring a little flair and uh, fun to that particular journey discussion because we've done some video inside the museum with Wild Bill Hickok and Charlie Utter. Uh, and then we'll have Randy join us live uh, for discussions. He's also a children's book author uh, and he's just a whole lot of fun. So hopefully it'll be a, a fun night of journey discussions on March 18th. On March 25th, we have a very special journey discussion coming called Reflections on the Massacre at Wounded Knee. This is uh, underwritten by the South Dakota Humanities Council, uh, and it's a very important program. Uh, it, the whole program is going to be actually a video that we've created in different vignettes and scenes throughout the Journey Museum itself, uh, brought to us by the actresses Lillian Witt, Jerry Gozen Center, and Joyce Jefferson. Uh, it's going to deal with the Wounded Knee Massacre. Uh, the effects of racism, uh, all of those types of conversation there. So hopefully we have, after that video is played, we'll have some very thoughtful discussions about what we can learn from that event and how we can continue to learn in 2021 uh, as we evolve in our communities. So before I do Paul's bio, we're going to a little clip of a video I'd like to share with all of you who've uh, signed in with us today. Uh, Alyssa, Master Control, uh, would you would you queue up so that everybody's got a reference point here, a little bit of video on the bridge itself at Remagen. We'll share that with our viewers here today. So we wanted to share that video with all of you just to kind of set the tone for where the place was here. Um, but I'd like to take a, a maybe maybe a little bit more time than usual. But I, I bet Paul Priest, uh, I want to tell you about Paul. He was born on December 25th, 1925 in Flint, Michigan. Uh, he was drafted into the U.S. Army on the 28th of June, 1944 uh, at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. He went to his basic training in Blandon, Florida, which Paul described to me as basically a swamp. Uh, <laughs> all, all expense paid trip to Florida, swamp, not the beach, the swamp. Um, 
Paul actually arrived in the European theater. Okay, you might have heard that his, he was born on December 25th, but he arrived at the European theater in time for on December 25th, 1944. And he joined the 9th Armored Division uh, at the front, and he was directly sent into the Battle of Bulge. So happy birthday, Merry Christmas, Paul. We're going to send you to the Battle of Bulge. That in itself was a pretty historic event, obviously. Um, Paul is the sole uh, surviving member of an eight-man reconnaissance team, which was charged with probing and gathering intelligence on German positions that could be attacked by artillery. His team used a half-track as their primary means of, convenient, of conveyance and were fully armed with rifles and handguns. Rifles were left behind in the half-track, and all team members carried an arsenal of handguns for close infighting and ease of movement. It was their mission not to be seen, get the intelligence, get back to headquarters for the artillery to take over. Did not always work out that way, but Paul is proud of the fact that all eight members of, of his team survived combat engagements. The team engaged tanks and machine gun emplacements, not due to choice, but because of discovery. Paul was directly involved in taking out a machine gun nest with a thrown grenade, among other actions. Paul also sustained a bullet wound during one encounter when a wooden bullet from a machine gun emplacement hit his helmet. He was knocked unconscious, but since it was only a flesh wound, he was immediately returned to service. That's, a that's tough, Paul. Um, so uh, the bridge at Remagen was actually made into a movie in 1969. It starred George Siegel, Robert Vaughn, Ben Gazzara, Brandon Dillman, and E.G. Marshall. And also a German film company made a television documentary recently titled Bridge at Remagen, which has been watched by millions of German viewers. Um, we're going to kind of have a two-part conversation here today, you guys. So. And uh, if you're not familiar, you can send a chat and I will moderate the questions that are coming in. But we're going to talk about the battle experience itself. And then Paul and his wife at the time, uh, Judy, uh, were able to go back to Remagen as part of that documentary. So we're going to talk a little bit about his return to Remagen and his experience there. Um, before I turn this over to Paul, I, I got to get out to a, a list of pieces of recognition that Paul received it in his time in service. Um, he was awarded uh, a Bronze Star Medal, a Good Conduct Medal, a European African Middle Eastern Campaign Medal with three Bronze Service Stars, a World War II Victory Medal, a Combat Inf Infantryman Badge, a Marksman's Badge with Carbine, Bar, and Rifle, Bar. And plus, he was given a citation from President Eisenhower, so they received a presidential citation uh, for all of his duties. So, so Paul, amazing. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, let's, let's start off by going back in time. It's March 7th, 1944. It's March 7th today, obviously. What was, what was going through your mind? in the morning before this engagement got started. Uh, on the end of the bridge, if you mean to the bridge, uh, you was thinking about it all the way ahead, ahead, ahead of time. Uh, we uh, went into the town and uh, I had a machine gunner that so was uh, holding us down. We couldn't go only so far and he had the street completely covered. And uh, finally, we got a tank up there, and a tank shot him and uh, shot the, the building and tore it all apart. So we got rid of that. But it's just uh, a thrilling life experience that you, you'd never expect, and, and it sticks in my mind completely, uh, going across that bridge, because we only had 20-some minutes to take it. So, so you didn't get a lot of time to think about anything then, huh? <laughs> That's about it. The main thing that I was thinking about all the time when I was there was getting on the other side of that bridge, not staying where I was at. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Paul, you know, when you're involved in this in engagement, um, 
it, I mean, what, what, what were your thoughts as a young man? I mean, you, you know, you're, you're just a teenager uh, still. Um, what, what, what's, 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 what's going through your mind? Do you have any historical references to any of this or is it just all mission oriented? Well, uh, you know, being a young fellow like I was at that time, and most of us was at the same time, uh, you, you, you just think about what's going to happen. Am I going to come out of this alive or am I not? That's it. And uh, yes, you're scared to death. Anybody that tells you they was not scared in the movies and things like that, they're, they're crazy. It's, a, it's just one of those things that you do not do. And uh, I never did. I, 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 I thought about things all through the whole thing. Uh, will, will I survive or will I not? So uh, it is just uh, it's pressure on you. And a person that can stand it and go through it. And uh, like I said, I've, I've gone through the depression. I've gone through everything else all the way up. So I, I, I think I, I've done pretty good. Yeah, well, you're, you're, how old are you now today, Paul? 95. 95. 95 at Christmas time, December the 25th. Yep. Well, I think you've done, I think you've done really, really well. So Alyssa just uh, slipped a picture up here uh, that you have written on, called it the sleeper. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? This was a, a machine gun nest that was on a roadblock, blocking the road. And uh, the, when I come up on him, he was laying there on the ground sleeping. And uh, we walked up with him. I walked up with an 18 to 20 foot of him, took the picture and backed away and left. The fellows that was in my control, in my patrol at that time said to me, why didn't you shoot him? I said, because he was on a roadblock. So there were soldiers on both sides of him somewhere, sir. So if I'd have shot him, it would have been all over us. We was up there to get reconnaissance, not to go up there and shoot people. So that was why we was backing off and leaving him there, lay there. But I, this has been a prize picture all of my life that I've had. And uh, I just won a couple contests this picture has of this soldier. They have one over in the Battle of the Bulge of it and everything like that. So it's in the museum over there. So it's, it's quite a pain. Uh, most of these pictures that he shows you here in my one album is all taken with a camera that I still have. It's in my display that I take out and show. So that's about it. And, and for those of you who are watching uh, this video online today, I mean, Paul has pages and pages of content. And so we kind of went through and sort of picked out some of I don't know if they're the best ofs, but just just to try to give you guys some sense for the history. And I, um, you know, we talked a little bit in depth there about reconnaissance, Paul. I mean, there was a time when you weren't always in reconnaissance too. I mean, you 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 weren't actually in reconnaissance at the time uh, when you were with the ninth, right? You were as you were taking the bridge. You were, you were doing other things then. You uh, you think more. Uh, anybody that tells you that was in the service that really knows it and, uh, and says the truth, yes, you're scared completely. You just wonder if you're going to make it or if you're not going to make it. That's it. And uh, I don't know. Uh, there's a few fellows like uh, different soldiers that, uh, that's war heroes where they've taken so many, uh, like Sergeant York shooting all those fellows in uh, not one one and bringing all them troops in. It's just, just those things happen. And you do things in the war that you would never do normally. That's it. So, Paul, this battle, how, how many days did the actual battle of, for the possession of the bridge? Uh, uh, or, or, when we got to the bridge on the 20 and uh, the, the 4th and 5th, we was outside in the outside line. And then we come up onto the bridge and saw it was still standing at, uh, on, uh, on March the 6th. And that's when the generals all come in there, Hodge, Leonard, and uh, Bradley, and those, and then they notified Eisenhower the bridge was still standing. It wasn't blowed up. 
they blew it, but uh, nothing, nothing. Uh, the ammunition, the uh, dynamite, and things that they had there was not not uh, made to blow a bridge like that. So that's why it didn't blow. And it's it's uh, it's very very unseen. And then uh, uh, Hodges said, uh, Hog said to us, "Go down and take the bridge, and you got 26 minutes to do it." So Timerson and his group went down first. They took the bridge, started. I was right in that one group that went down there the first time we went across the bridge. So we was across there in a, that one day. One day we took the bridge. Wow. So now let's, let's talk about the strategy of the Germans. I believe at that time they were blowing up all the bridges, right, Paul? Right. And, and, that was and the last bridge on the Rhine River. Okay. When we went across, we stranded over 80,000 troops, Germans that could get out, get, get back into Germany because there was no bridge at the time. They had to put in pontoon bridges to get across with. Well, and, and, and I have read, and I mean, you can share uh, better detail, I'm sure, but the possession of this bridge was a key point uh, for our efforts here in World War II. Uh, yeah. At least it's pointed at historically. Um, but, but talk about, again, why this was so important for us to possess this particular bridge and how that helped really uh, kind of bolster our side here in our efforts. <laughs> Well, it was a railroad bridge, see, and uh, the trains would go through there with soldiers taking them back home into Germany. And uh, when we took the bridge and, uh, and occupied it, well, that stopped all of that, and we had them all surrounded on the other side here so that they couldn't get back into Germany. So there are some of our troops going across the bridge here in this picture that you're showing right now. And uh, it's, you go from post to post to go across that bridge. And that's and this. This is this picture to see on the left here is not. Uh, I mean, they're just marching over there. The bridge has already been taken. You don't you don't see the ones that's uh, where they're running across the bridge. Right. Well, now uh, uh, I think. Uh, well, I'm I'm sure I've read or or you've told me that you had something to do with that sign there and that other photo that that is. Uh, on the screen right now. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Well, uh, the one on the left is just our troops going across walking. And uh, the, there's a hole in it, and then it shows on the right-hand side here was patched up so they could run tanks over the top of it and uh, things like that. Now, the one on the right is uh, the entrance to the bridge, and that's a sign over here on the building that, said to uh, walk across the Rhine River with the compliments of the Ninth Armor with dry feet. So that's, uh, we, we made that sign up together, <laughs> the bunch of us did, and put it up there. So, I mean, the, you know, I mean, I guess that's a little bit of brightness in the middle of something that's so dramatic. And uh, to your point, it's scary what you guys are doing. And, you know, you know you're in full peril. Uh, every day, so I guess that was a, a good exercise in, uh, in in doing something that was a little uplifting. Yeah, this is, this is a picture now of the later years, right now, like it is right now. And this is the entrance to the bridge. This is uh, the pillars on one side. You can see them through the middle there on the other side of the river, and uh, it's it's kind of hard to to explain how the bridge was there and they cleaned it all out, but they never rebuilt it. They, they, they use it as a tourist trap now. I, I call it a tourist trap because they run ferries across there constantly, night and day. And you can go across from one side to the other. Yeah, so uh, Paul, uh, just again, back to the experience itself, the battle at, at Remagen. Um, What's a big, what should everybody really know? I mean, uh, about that battle and how important that was. I mean, you know, if I put you on the spot here and just give you a few minutes to just say, this is why March 7th, 1944 really needs to be known. What, what, what do we need to have uh, on our recording here today so that this is shared uh, forever now? 
I, I figure, and uh, they used to say in the books and I, that I have here, there was a ninth armored Lux uh, from Germany, which I brought back with me, uh, that this was the end of the war. When we, did, when we took that bridge, that stopped Germany from really fighting. Everybody over on the other side was just taking out and throwing their guns down and to want to go home the way they went. So at that, that end of the war, just one month or a little over a month, uh, the Germans surrendered because they was trapped. They couldn't get any more, uh, enough troops back home to, to fight, really. Well, so I feel that was an important part of the war, and that's why I talked to it all for years and years and years now. Well, it's got to be very satisfying for yourself to have been involved in this particular battle and know that that helped create the finality to a world, you know, world war. Um, uh, talk about your own personal feelings about that, Paul. Well, it's, uh, I'll tell you, if uh, the war, if we would not won that war, you would have been in the hands of Adolf Hitler. And the way they treated the people, 90% of you people that would listen to this program or see it would not be here because we saved the rest of the states, I mean, the rest of the United States here in the country, and just by winning that war. Yeah, there, there was some pretty terrible things uh, that was occurring there, and not really the point of our program to bring that imagery into the game, but that is the reason this conflict occurred, is because of how poorly Germany was treating uh, many uh, populations of people uh, throughout Europe, and obviously, uh, specifically Jewish religion, uh, was a was one of their uh, big objections. Uh, so we can't forget that uh, as we look at history. That's history, right? And uh, so, actually. Uh, this picture that I, I just something I'll put in here right now. This picture here, if you're looking at it, you're looking on the other side of the river. We're on this side. That hill behind there, up on the top, is well loaded with 88 guns. And the Germans uh, had left, and only about five or six of them was up there optimal that they could use. So that was a, that was the coverage for the bridge. So did you guys know that from reconnaissance that uh, all of that then, Paul, or had you learned that through reconnaissance or did you learn that after the bridge? Yes, we knew it because they okay. could, you could see the bread, the guns up there. 88s would just fire any place, down, up, or anywhere. It was the most deadly gun in the war, I think. And, uh, you know, so that made the, that event pretty precarious, knowing those guns were settled up there above the bridge. Um, there's an awful lot of risk there. This, this is the bridge that uh, they come in and tried to bomb it. They shot missiles in on it, uh, big missiles uh, to, just to get it, but they never hit the bridge. They missed it every time. Uh, the planes come in and bombed all around it and uh, never damaged it enough to shut it down. And uh, the, this is where I saw the first jet fighter. And that was a German ME2. Wow. And that was, he came over the bridge and uh, our planes took out after him and he just, he just left them setting. I mean, he just took off and away he went. Wow. It's a, it was quite a battle uh, to the bridge. And uh, like I said, it's, you, you stop and think back on it. What was you thinking when you went across? That's what people said. Uh, the only thing I thought when it went to my mind is going from this place to that place, and I want to get over there alive. And that's what you was doing, going from pillar to pillar to get across. Yeah. How long did that? How long did it actually take to get across the bridge, then, Paul? Just about uh, sixty-eight minutes, something like that. Okay. We went across uh, the other towers on the other side. Uh, was uh, had machine guns in the top. One group of our group that went over there, he got those machine gunners up on the top and, uh, and uh, threw their guns into the Rhine River and captured them. 
and that stopped the machine guns from up in the, in the pot. The 88 guns up there, the tanks was taking care of them off in the river and knocked out most of them. So we stopped off the 88s up on the hill and also we stopped off there with the machine guns on the other side. You, you got to remember uh, your history books, if you look back on it and talk with them, the ones that was left in on the other side in that tunnel was elderly people, people that was injured and uh, that was all that was left there to guard that bridge. So actually we didn't have a lot of uh, really, really I strong soldiers build there. But well, it was a battle. Uh, uh, I guess that's fortunate, you know? I mean, that, 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 that that's works out for all of us here. Um, Paul, you know, I, I don't know if I mentioned this as I was introducing you guys, but you're currently you're the sole survivor uh, from this battle here. And through the years, you've also been involved in additional documentaries uh, where you actually returned to Remagen and, and your, your longtime wife was able to attend with you at that time. Unfortunately, I know you've, you've lost her, but let's talk about returning to Remagen and your experiences with the documentary and even the history. I know uh, before we started the program here, uh, some of you who join us, you know, we do a little practice session, but Paul's talking about all the museums and the history that's in Germany right now. Uh, so Paul, I'm gonna let, I'd like for you to take some time and share these experiences uh, of returning to Remagen uh, and seeing all the changes. Uh, obviously, the bridge itself ha ha has changed a lot, as we saw in that other photo. But I'm going to turn it over to you and let you talk about your experience of, uh, of the return. Well, the experience of going all back over to Germany, I always wanted to go. But uh, I stopped to the donut shop every morning. And the fellows in there that sat there, there was about eight or nine or ten of us there that's there every morning. And we'd stop and they'd said something about, well, why don't you go back to Germany? I said, I can't afford to go back to Germany. I said, it's just impossible. They started taking up an offerings around town. And we had people in, in Rapid City area donate the money for the wife and I to take two weeks and go over to Germany, fly over and go back over the route that I did during the war. And uh, two days after we was over there, at night, the man that was leading the group was, is a fellow that takes trips over there constantly all the time. He's in all the magazines. But uh, he, um, he said that, uh, you know, every place we've been for two days now, he said, you remember. He said, you remember the towns, you remember the roads, you remember the streets around there where they are, and it's completely rebuilt now. I mean, it's, it's impossible to tell. Are those folks there's experiences over there that uh, uh, when these museums, as I say, that they had in Germany, I say are very, very attractive museums. When you'd see an airplane, you'd hear the airplane engine. You'd hear a tank engine when you'd see a tank. You know, you'd see a machine gun fire. You'd see machine gun fire. You could hear it. They were, they was all sound. So it was very attractive. Uh, and the people were very, very friendly. Would you take a picture with my boy? Uh, he would like to have a picture of you. And uh, sign autographs, I've signed more autographs over there when I was over there than, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, that's great, that's it was, great. It was a, a trip of a lifetime, that's what I called it. I wrote, uh, I had two, through two books written and the return to Remagen, and then I got the last one to return to Remagen. Then they sent uh, the Mervit movie group over here from the International Broadcasting Company in Germany to do the, the film to, with me as a documentary at the back end of this. I uh, have about 15 to 20 minutes in the film, and uh, it's explaining what happened and things like that. And uh, it's... Uh, is something they 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 come down here they came over here we was going to go over there they was going to fly us over but they come over here and paid me to to, to go to 
Pennsylvania to watch a movie down there. Not the movie, but the reactment of the bridge. They do it every year. So the year we went down there, they had over 5,000 people there. The town was all closed down. We had German troops and American troops fighting during the city. So it was quite a, quite a thrill to get over to Germany again and see all these buildings and everything. I, you know, I, I probably... I know the bridge was over the Rhine River, Paul, but could you, for everybody's benefit, give a little bit of a locator for Remagen? Uh, uh, is there uh, an another, uh, is there no, uh, near the another? The, actually, the town is a, uh, it's a Lufendal bridge, and uh, the town on one side is Remagen. The other one on the other side is not. It's a different thing. But uh, it's a, uh, it's it's now it's like I say it's a, there's one 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 promenade walk on the side of the river on uh, the one side it's all stores with restaurants and and uh, shops and things like that completely for a, over a mile a mile and a half I would say of just buildings bicycles bicycles all over Germany. And you never find a, a tarred roof or a shingled roof in Germany. They're all croc roofs. Okay. <laughs> and why is that, Paul? I don't know. They just do that <laughs> in Germany in the same way. You, you never had a front yard. You was built right out to the sidewalk. But you had a backyard, which was beautiful. I mean, there'd be flowers and fountains and everything else in the back. But uh, in German towns, and most most of them, uh, your buildings are right out to the edge of the sidewalk. So uh, I don't know why that is, but I mean that's it. And uh, like I say, uh, I went when we went back over there and uh, uh, for the trip, and uh, uh, we never found buildings. Wind uh, wind powers all over all over Germany, all over Germany. Wow, most of their power is wind. So now, Paul, uh, the the documentary of uh, filming that you did, I mean, uh, you were saying earlier, now you ended up, what, with 15 to 20 minutes, you were saying, in yeah. the movie itself, but I think you were probably engaged for a significant amount of time uh, doing yeah, that. The that copy kind that of I got from them, that they sent me back of the whole thing, uh, everything was done in German, except where they talked to me and the other two fellows that they interviewed for over there. I mean, it was in the Ninth Army over there. But uh, I was the only one that went across the bridge first. The other two uh, was there two weeks afterwards. Now, what year was that uh, that you did that? Was that was in 1945, March the 7th. Uh, no, I mean, the. I apologize, the documentary, when you guys did the documentary. The documentary was made in, uh, uh, let's see, that's five years ago now. Almost okay. five years ago. Okay. So we've yeah, been tried to... about uh, 2015. Close enough. <laughs> Pretty close. Our, our Rapid City Matt High School math here in full action. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Paul, um, you know, is there some other things? I mean, Alyssa ran through some of the pictures. Uh, from the museums? Uh, is there some other uh, experiences that you'd like to share? I mean, we, we talked about how in Germany, they're doing such a great job with the history. And I kind of even speculated it's because they're trying to make sure that they're making amends. Uh, but is there any other personal experiences or things that you drew from uh, in your return that you'd like to share with our group today? Uh well, as like they had me kind of scared when we decided to go, when they decided to send us back over there, because the wife was worried about getting shot because you know being an American going back over there fought in that war, and uh, it's uh, no the people was very very friendly. I mean it was uh, nothing to go into a restaurant and have somebody come up and want to get your autograph and take a picture of you with their kids or with themselves and things like that. I mean it's. Uh, the people in uh, Germany was real, real friendly. The thing that the wife got the biggest thing about uh, Germany is when you go into a restaurant, people come in with dogs. 
they'd bring in dogs with them or cats or whatever they want to bring in there. They'd just walk them in there and there ain't any restaurant. I mean, you could bring them in there. There were very few restaurants that we saw that, that they refused them. They would let them bring them in. Well, uh, I can't say that I've ever been in a restaurant with a cat. <laughs> that, that'd be different. <laughs> uh, the only thing well, they'd bring in is pickings of pigs and chickens. <laughs> <laughs> And see, this is part of us. Uh, this this is how we do these programs, right? We talk about pigs, That's chickens, right. and cats. Now, uh, it was not planned, but we're 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 where we're at on everything here. Uh, you know, Paul and I were were kind of joking before this program from the perspective of this is the way it is in 2021. You just stay flexible and you and you keep kind of rolling through with changing with things and and. Uh, and, and today is, is an opportunity of that. Um, Paul, what what else would you like to share today with folks? And uh, I'll remind people I sent out a chat uh, note to you that you can send me a question and I can moderate it back to Paul. But, but Paul, I, I really want to let you tell all the stories that you want to tell during this conversation too. There are so many stories that's in my head that I could tell about World War II, the living funny, and uh, things that's funny and uh, not funny. And uh, I was one of the ones that went out over there. I said, I, it's something I had to do, so let's do it. And uh, most of the troops that we that was with me, with me was the same way. We don't give up. We went. My 9th Armored Division was a steerhead division, which was uh, stuck out front. A lot of times we were stuck 20, 30 miles out in front of the other groups on each side. And uh, it's, uh, we were just on the go. There's only two times that I was over in Germany during the war that I dug a foxhole. The rest of the time I, I slept in schools, I slept in old buildings, I slept on the top of the half track on the hood, Started up at night when I was on a roadblock and throw a blanket over me, lay down there and sleep when my time was off. When the other fella had to come on, he'd get up there and say, on there. So, no, it's, a, it's an experience. Uh, I say I survived, but uh, a lot of them did not. But the ones that I appreciate is the ones that really fought. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say... Uh, you take to the Ardennes force, the biggest percentage of the troops that was killed there was not shot with guns or anything like that. They was hit with trees. The Germans would fire into the trees, and the trees were big pine trees, and they'd just splinter and come down and get them. And that's where, that's one of the things that uh, always fascinated and stuck in my mind. And like I said, I was, I was stationed on a roadblock one, one time on a road section where there was five roads, and I had to watch, stay there until my ninth armored troops came through. And so they dropped me off there at 10 o'clock in the morning, and it got towards evening, and I, I went out and collected up all the guns and everything I could find down there, laying all over every place and put them in a gas station. I stayed there. But I did not find that out until later on. That was where they shot the 11 colored people and left them laying in the field. And it was right across the road from where I was staying in the gas station. But now there's a big monument sitting there now, and it's, uh, I have pictures of it and everything, that you know, that monument is there. But uh, it's, I say that we're lucky that we won that war. This world would have been a mess if we would have lost it to Germany. Because the way he treated people and the way the stormtroopers treated people, it was just unbearable. Yeah, well, uh, I, I I never realized about those pine trees. That, that's, uh, uh, I guess that makes sense. I mean, I, I appreciate you sharing that, uh, Paul. Uh, I've got a couple questions that have popped up. Uh, um, one is... Uh, someone's wondering, oh, if you were drafted or if you volunteered. I was drafted. I, I had one. I had six months to go to graduation in high school. And uh, back in 1950, 
I applied for a, a graduation certificate through the Central High School over here. And they, they said that you could get a certificate there if you never got one when you were done, before you went into service. So I went over here and applied for it and got it. But the Central High School was the one I was born to back in Flint, Michigan when I, when I was drafted. But no, I was drafted. And, uh, uh, you know, as young as I was at that time, that was quite an experience to go into the service and get all those shots and everything and the way they put you through a, tra- a checkout line, you know. You walk in the room and they say, did you have this? You have that bang. One in the arm, bang, and another one in the other arm. And you go on through the whole thing and that's it. But uh, it's it, drafting was a lot different then than it is nowadays. Thank you for sharing that, Paul. And I'm glad to hear that you're now in a, a Rapid City Central Cobbler uh, <laughs> alumni. I guess. You know, like I said, that diploma does not mean anything, but it's the idea that I've got it. <laughs> I did so, graduate. <laughs> so, you know, once once they got you there and they got all those shots into you, Paul, uh, how long was the basic training down in Florida? Pardon? How long get... was your basic training down in Florida? when you I was down there about uh, four months, two to three, two to three months. Well, I was drafted in February, uh, and so uh, I didn't go over to Germany, you see, until in uh, November, last part of November. I think we left um, uh, New York on the 28th, I believe it was. I'd have to check my book to make sure on that. So uh, in training, did you, like, get tested so that you could graduate out, or did they just run you through for X number of weeks? How, what was that process like? Uh, pardon, I didn't. I didn't understand that either. It, it, in your training, was that like you had to be tested at certain things, or did they just no, run no. you through for? It was, uh, when I landed on basic training the first day, they they took us out and showed us the uh, troops how you go over a brick wall. I mean, over a well, stone wall or anything, fifteen to twenty foot high. I couldn't make it. A second story window, I couldn't make it. Before I left that camp, though, I was going over a 15-foot wall into second-story windows in the houses. I was a lot younger. When I went into the service, uh, before I went in, I was, weighed about uh, 240 pounds. When I came out of base tra- basic training, I was about 180 something. I mean, wow. they, they took it off from me and put it down. If you saw the pictures uh, that uh, is in my books, uh, I was a skinny little fellow when I come back for service. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm having a hard time imagining you as 240 pounds when I was looking at all those pictures of you in in the service there. So, obviously, they uh, they really put you through the boot camp there then, didn't they, Paul? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, boot camp was a thing, like I said, when you stayed in pop tents or anything, you had to make sure you sealed it up because those, those snakes would crawl in with you and kill you. We had three or four of them killing, not my group, but I mean, in my right in the village right next to us, it was all in it. Yeah, for you folks that are listening online, Paul shared with me earlier while we were testing things that uh, the, his basic training camp there in Florida was in a swamp, and there was lots of coral snakes at that time. Oh, yes. And yes. so it was uh, somewhat of a perilous place to be training, uh, and now you're saying there was some Guys that were lost because of snake bite, I guess. The longest one I ever saw, there was about a 10-foot rattler, and he was a big one. (laughs) He just ate a pig and was laying across the path, and a couple of fellows stumbled over him, and that's how we saw him. Otherwise, we we just left him alone. He went on off in the path, but he had a big pig in him where he got him. But that was about the biggest one that I'd seen. I saw a lot of little coral snakes, but none that was uh, that I would want to even touch. <laughs> near. Well, needless to say. They're strictly netty. No, oh, no, I've got part it. Part of that camp of now is owned by Disney Corporation. Oh. Disneyland is built on it. So a uh, piece of it is Disney. That's how I say it. I, I went to training in Disney Club, Disneyland. <laughs> um, so... Um, 
I've got a question here, and I, and I apologize to the writer if I if I don't have it quite right. But um, was gun disease, hunger, or hypothermia a big problem uh, for casualties, Paul? I, I think where we're trying to go is like you know the other diseases. Uh, hypothermia, how big of issues were that for the troops? I never I never run across much of that. We got poisoned a couple times with ice cream and different things. But uh, as for being that type of a thing, that type of war, it's not, no, we wasn't. We never. Uh, most of it, if you, you got shot or if you uh, uh, froze, some of them froze, because during the Battle of the Falls, you, 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 you didn't have this clothes that you do nowadays. And they right. just close to death. But otherwise, uh, no, no, we never had that many diseases during that war. In my group, now, don't, don't, I'm not saying the rest of them, because if you take the Pacific, yes, you get a lot of them. You right. Get, you're getting uh, a lot of things in disease in, in uh, Pacific, but not in Germany. So, Paul, you, you, probably been asked a form of this type of question before i've got someone one of our attendees who's uh, reading tom brokaw's the greatest generation um and he, and he would like for you to share uh your perspective on the difference between the greatest generation and today's generations now now you're asking a question that's that's, that's a really a problem you know in my lifetime i have seen the world completely change. You never, in my younger days, seen people running around with telephones in their hands, playing games. Uh, I, When I was a kid, my dad used to take cardboard and put in my shoes because it's so hard up that we did that uh, because I'd run holes in the bottom of my shoes. But uh, no, uh, I don't know, it's a, it's a complete world change in my lifetime. A really complete change. Cars and everything else. I mean, people and the way the people act nowadays is entirely different than it was in those days. And uh, it's uh, I don't know what, what to tell you anything else on that because that's strictly out of my class there. I, it's hard to say what people are thinking nowadays and what they're not. Because, uh, you know, in those, in those days, uh, like my dad, he worked. He done floor covering work. He done work. He done dentures. I worked on a railroad when I was young, twenty cents an hour. I got a raise to forty cents an hour before I got off of it. But I was working as a section hand. Uh, you know, I felt the best that way, but not out in the country and working like that. But uh, that was a wages at that time. I mean, you, you just, uh, you didn't have the money and things that you do nowadays. Uh, they arguing over the, you was lucky if you got a uh, dollar an hour in those days. I mean, that was just the thing. Nowadays, they fight over getting $15 an hour. Yeah, we've, we've advanced that. And maybe someone will be doing a program yeah. 80 years yeah. from now, and then $15 will sound like a dollar. Who knows? You know, it's uh, hard to talk to me about that. And then you talk to somebody else that's 40 or 50 years old. They say, well, well I feel different about this myself. Uh, but, you know, if you, you figure the, the 50-year-old on up, they might not even been here if we'd have lost a war. That's what I try to tell everybody. If, if you was that way, you would have never been here. Because yeah, we would have been blown apart. Yeah, well, thankfully, it worked out for us. So, Paul, I, I had another question, and, and I think we briefly talked about this, but, you know, still a question in regards to the German strategy of blowing up the bridges. Why were, why were they blowing up bridges when the bridges were so important? Because it's so easy to get across them and have troops go across if you if you had to cross a river like the Rhine River, and uh, it's it's wide, they run big boats up and down it. I mean, and it's uh, they run cruises up and down it, and everything like that. So it's hard to get across. So if they if you had a bridge left there, there was troops going across them. 
So that's why they blew them up themselves because they were losing the war. They started losing. When they started losing, they started blowing bridges. And now, like uh, uh, this uh, bridge too far, people confuse that with the Rhine River. That is not the same bridge. It's completely different. That was the British that captured that bridge. Okay. Yeah, and and I and I know uh, I apologize if I may have actually said we might have said something about a bridge too far, or the bridge over the river uh, yeah. Kwai instead yeah. of the Battle of Remagen. You know, the return the bridge to Remagen. So I'm glad you clarified that, Paul. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, so we're getting close to the end here. I will encourage people if you've got another question or two. But I'm going to give this back to Paul again. Uh, Paul, we've got just a little bit of time left. Uh, Again, if if there's kids watching this, and there'll be kids watching these programs, um, what do you want them to know? What do you want them to uh, take away from this lesson? Uh, Well, like I say, it's it's a different generation, a a different attitude in the people themselves. So it's hard to say to these kids, uh, this is history. I meet someone on the street that's 25, 27 years old, and they say, I remember, hey, Paul, I remember you. You remember me? No, I don't. Well, you told us about it, the World War the two stories in, in uh, way back in Wilson School, well, which I was a crossing guard for 24 years there. And so I... I would have this every year. I'd have a show there and put on my display and everything and have all of my, all of my artifacts and everything there with me to show. So I, I think, uh, like I said, during the war, my one album book, my main album book, 40% of those pictures in there was taken with the camera that I've got. And I had no trouble getting them developed in a, in a reconnaissance group because I, they just developed them to be, to get the pictures. And I've got them. I've got thousands and thousands of pictures. I mean, so you just, you can go and if you want to look, I can look through anything and find just about anything you want to find during that time. But the world is a different world completely nowadays than it was at those times, at that time. Because- well, Paul, you're talking about being a crossing guard. I forgot to mention that for all of you on the program, Paul has been Santa Claus for a number of years. Uh, uh, last year, though, was a little different. No, no Santa Claus in the public, but you know he's he's been Santa here at the Journey a couple times, and he's w- with the Humane Society of the Black Hills. And so, obviously, Paul, you're very engaged uh, with youth uh, in a lot of different ways. I got an interesting question here that came in uh, while you're in Germany. Uh, I've got a viewer who wants to know if you had an opportunity to try any of the German wine, and I'll expand on that question and say, was there any particular German food that you uh, enjoyed? No. Uh, the thing that I liked in Germany is uh, their bread. Their bread is terrific. I love it. I used to get those round loaves of bread over there, and it was just a nice bread. Uh, as for drinking, I was never one to drink a lot. So I had some beer over there and stuff like that, but their, their, their beer was at that time was real weak, real weak. It didn't, it didn't affect you. Uh, we got frozen uh, ice cream. The town in the town froze the ice cream, and ninety percent of the troops in my in my company was sick from the eating the ice cream, which I did not eat that much, so I didn't get that sick, <laughs> which I normally will eat a lot of it. But uh, again. Uh, that's uh, it's it's just a different different world, a different world. Their food was real good. I liked their potatoes, mashed potatoes, and they and they fry them in patties, and that was real good. But uh, the bread was a uh, was uh, I'd trade I'd trade cigarettes for the bread and the stuff like that when I'd go in a town where there was a bakery, and then I'd get one of those breads. So uh, that's what I always did. Because I never smoked all my life. I, that's one of the things I don't do. I never did. Maybe that's what contributed to my lifetime. I don't know. But Well, it, it, it probably has helped, right? Oh, I yes. mean, there, there you go. So, 
which kind uh, of so uh, it's the German uh, bread that you recommend. Some of these questions they ask you, they they uh, away from the, what I'm doing uh, in the war deal. You know, I mean, they're they're completely away from it like that. What's the food? I mean, the food is okay, but uh, you know, because there, there there's a lot of different things that they make in Germany that's entirely different from ours. But I I survived. So, Paul, I've got a question, and I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but uh, I've got some folks, I've got someone asking, is there another place where they can see more of the pictures? I know right now we're in possession of a bunch of your photo albums and stuff, but is there, uh, have you worked with the Air and Space Museum, created a digital archive, anything like that? Uh, uh, I help make the, help them put the, the World War II stories together in the, uh, in uh, the library and we used to come in and have a different one come in every month and tell his story of what he did during the war in world war ii but then they kind of got away from it we we couldn't we had to lose give up the library so we went out to the, the school of mines uh i mean the, the other college out there on on 44 and uh, we we had it there for a while and then we went out to the aerospace museum and every month we'd have a different speaker and then tell what they did during the war. Now it's gone back. We, they've enlarged that out now that we're covering all of the wars, you know, the Korean War and the whole works. So you have a different speaker each month. But uh, my biggest group that I had was 280 some people out in the, the school, not uh, the, the one on 44. And I, I had a, a program there and set up my whole display. I, I can set up three eight foot tables completely of show, show effects, things like that, guns and everything. All of the guns that I have now are all duplicates that I take out on displays because uh, most of your places will not let you come in with a loaded gun or a live gun. And everything's in cases and uh, it's just, uh, you can talk for hours on it. I mean, you can go and uh, uh, all of it, most of it, uh, not like the daggers and them, those are all, those are real. Those are real. But the guns are not, they're duplicates. So they're the same type of gun that I had during the war. I carried a 38 and a Luger long barrel. And that was, that was what I carried during the war. But uh, I don't know, I don't know what else to tell you on that. It's, it's, it's kind of hard. It's a, you know, you figure in 95 years, there's quite a been a, quite a change in the world. And in the last 20 years, there's been quite a change in the world. We'll survive. I hate to think about what the kids 20 years from now will be, if we survive that long. But I, I, I on my talks, when I go out and talk to the uh, organization or anything like that, I say, I defied. Uh, I survived the depression. I survived 75 years of marriage. I survived the World War II, and I'm still here yet. I'm hanging on. I'm shooting for that 100 mark, but I don't know if I'll make it. <laughs> I'm not going to bet against you, Paul. I think you're going to yeah, you're going to go further than that. Um, so, uh, I, any other? Closing final thoughts. I um, oh. I think, Paul, uh, I, I'm so grateful that we've had the opportunity to get to know each other and to be able to do this program here today. And I'm grateful for the folks who signed in here on Sunday afternoon, a beautiful Sunday afternoon. And, and again, one of the good changes from 2020's experiences, us making recordings of programs like this, um, we routinely used to host turtle soups on Fridays and learning forums on Sundays. And uh, to my chagrin now, we didn't make recordings of programs. Uh, and obviously out of ne necessity and need, we changed uh, during 2020. I mean, uh, last year at this time, March uh, 7th, uh, we didn't know what Zoom was. Now we're hosting programs on Zoom and 
And again, you guys can see we're doing this safe. Paul's in a different room than myself broadcasting. Our marketing manager's in another space. And, you know, we're hoping the vaccines will keep getting out there. Uh, Paul's had his vaccine, so that's a good thing. And uh, hopefully this fall we'll be able to get some other programs where we can actually invite you back into the museum and see those things. Um, Paul, any final words? Otherwise, I'm getting close to wrapping us up here on the top of the hour. The thing I would like to say is things like this should not be hidden. It should be brought out to the public. It used to be put in the paper, but the last three or four years, they haven't put anything in on it. And uh, I used to have articles in the paper constantly and all over every place. And uh, it's just the idea that they should keep this alive because I don't want to see the world act like it did during World War II. I mean, in Germany. And if the German troops took over like that, well, they, they've got to learn to live together. That's it. We've got to live together. Well, I just got a nice note from one of our guests, just flat out thanking you for your service. Uh, someone who's also put in, who's been serving uh, here in the Air Force uh, 22 years. So thank, thanks to that person's service. And again, to all the men and women who, who served our country. Um, but I mean, I think I, I'm sure everybody on this uh, video uh, live today and also who will watch it, we all thank you and for what you, your contributions to all of us. In it, this. it seems like this last year, although we've had this virus condition, that I've had more people come up and thank you for being in the service and doing the, jo the job you did. If we wouldn't have done it, we wouldn't have been there. Like I said, the world would have been a different thing. So uh, I just pray to God every day that, hey, let's, let's get those things leveled out and get it going like it should be, and uh, we'll be all right. So. Well, I, uh, again, thank you. Thanks all the men and the women. Uh, I, we're gonna, I'm gonna wrap this program up. Okay. And, uh, Folks, uh, watch for us to edit and uh, reposition the, the program. You can share it with other folks. It will be at journeymuseum.org. Uh, and as journey discussions, uh, just check in on all of that. And so we'll close today, Paul, because I always have to say something to this effect. Somehow, some way, the journey will continue. And I know you're going to get to 100 plus. So thank you. Sarah. <laughs> I'm shooting. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.